Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Joshua Gimon? This case was the topic of an Unsolved Mysteries episode released in October 2022. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Joshua Guimond was born on June 18, 1982, and grew up in Maple Lake, Minnesota. He was described as humorous, studious, athletic, outgoing, and happy. Joshua had his career path mapped out with quite a bit of detail. He wanted to go to law school, work as a lawyer, then become a politician. Specifically, he wanted to run for the Minnesota State House of Representatives. His family joked that Joshua would have someday become the President of the United States. This, of course, is ridiculous. Joshua was too conscientious and logical for that job. Joshua graduated from Maple Lake High School in 2000. He was the senior class president and valedictorian. In addition, his classmates voted him the most likely to succeed. After high school, Joshua attended St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, and majored in political science. Collegeville is about an hour and ten minutes northwest of Minneapolis. St. John's University is a private, Catholic, liberal arts college for men. There's another university six miles away, the College of St. Benedict, which is for women. Joshua had a girlfriend named Katie. The couple started dating in 1998 when they were both in high school. Katie went to the College of St. Benedict and continued to date Joshua. However, during their junior year, the couple broke up. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. On November 9, 2002, Joshua went to lunch with a roommate and friend named Nick. Joshua also worked on a paper about Alexander Hamilton. Joshua and Nick had received an invitation from Katie, Joshua's former girlfriend, to hang out in her apartment that evening. Nick decided to take Katie up on her offer. Joshua declined Katie's offer and decided to attend a party at the dormitory apartment of a friend of his named Nate. Joshua left his dormitory apartment around 11 p.m. with his friends Alex and Greg. Joshua returned at 11.06 p.m. The police would later say that he probably went back into his apartment to grab some beer. When Joshua left for the second time, he walked to Nate's apartment, which was three minutes away. He arrived sometime around 11.30. Maybe it took him a while to pick up the beer, or perhaps he made a detour. There were about 10 to 12 young people at the party. Some of them did not know Joshua. The party involved playing poker and consuming alcohol. Joshua's behavior appeared to be within a normal range, nothing out of character. He was joking around and drinking during the party. Some partygoers said that he may have been intoxicated. Sometime around 11.45 p.m., Joshua stood up from the table without saying a word and walked toward the front door. The bathroom was in the same direction, so people thought maybe that was his destination. In reality, he had left the party. Joshua's friend and roommate Nick had been at Katie's apartment that night, as I mentioned. Nick arrived back at the dormitory at 2.42 a.m., now on November 10. He noticed that Joshua was not there. Nick thought he was still at the party. At 4.20 p.m., about 16 hours after Joshua went missing, three of his friends contacted campus security and reported him missing. They noticed that he missed a pre-law society meeting, which was out of character. Joshua's mother called the police at 11.30 p.m. after being notified by the college. Here's what the police found during their investigation. There was a lake between the apartment where the party was held and Joshua's apartment. Many people thought that Joshua fell in this lake and drowned. In the spring, the police searched this lake and a few other lakes with no success. Campus buildings, as well as swamps and wooded areas surrounding the campus, were also searched. There was no sign of Joshua. In Joshua's dormitory apartment, the police found his glasses, contact lens case, wallet, credit cards, 
his car keys, and his coat. It was very cold outside during this time of the year. It did not appear as though Joshua was planning on being outside for too long. Joshua's computer was still on, and his schoolwork was on his desk. The police did not bother to secure Joshua's bedroom. Joshua's car had not been moved. The police used a dog to track Joshua's scent. The dog tracked the scent to a location near a bridge that was between where the party was held and Joshua's apartment. This bridge was along the expected route for Joshua if he was headed back to his dormitory. A man matching Joshua's description was spotted by a young man and a young woman who were walking together on that bridge. This was between 12.15 a.m. and 12.30 a.m. on November 10. The couple said that they saw the individual crossing the bridge. When they looked back, he was gone. On January 5, 2003, Joshua's family brought in a bloodhound named Hoover, who tracked Joshua's scent to the back of St. John's Abbey on the college campus. Not long after this, the police attacked the credibility of Hoover, the bloodhound. It's not clear why they did not trust the dog. Maybe they pulled Hoover's criminal record and found that he had charges like possession of a dog biscuit or felony destruction of shoelaces. After not having any success searching the area, the police developed a renewed interest in Joshua's apartment and specifically in his computer. An examination of the computer revealed that somebody had used a program to delete the internet search history after Joshua disappeared. However, the vast majority of items on the computer had not been erased. The police discovered that Joshua was on Yahoo Personals using three different profiles. With two of the profiles, he was pretending to be female and chatting with various men. Joshua had both heterosexual and homosexual adult content on his computer. He appeared to be looking for casual encounters and may have been exploring his sexuality. In 2002, campus security had documented two separate incidents before Joshua went missing, which could be relevant to this case. Both incidents involved an orange Pontiac Sunfire being spotted in locations consistent with what the police called hookup areas. In one instance, when the vehicle was approached, a college-age male ran out of the passenger seat into the darkness and was never identified. The driver was questioned and said that he was just dropping the student off. I guess the student ran out of the car because he was eager to get back to school. According to the Unsolved Mysteries episode covering this case, the police spoke to the driver of this Pontiac, but they could not examine his vehicle because it had been crushed. I presume they were referring to a junkyard crushing the car. Now moving to my analysis. There are several theories about what happened to Joshua. The police initially believed that he fell into one of these several lakes in the area. They have since revised their theory. Now they believe that Joshua was murdered, possibly by someone who he was meeting for a casual sexual encounter. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against each of the theories about what happened to Joshua. Theory number one is that Joshua drowned in a lake. Looking at the factors supporting this theory, Joshua may have been intoxicated when he left the party. He had started drinking several hours prior to attending the party. Joshua was last seen on a bridge near a large lake. A police dog tracked Joshua's scent to an area near the same bridge. Looking at the factors against this theory, the police have thoroughly searched all the lakes in the area and they are convinced Joshua's body is not in those lakes. Theory number two is that Joshua's friend and roommate Nick was somehow involved or perhaps some other friend was involved. Looking at the factors supporting this theory, in the Unsolved Mysteries episode, the police talked about contradicting stories regarding Nick's movements. Joshua's ex-girlfriend Katie said that Nick left her apartment between 1 and 1.30 a.m. on November 10. The apartment was only about 7 to 10 minutes away by motor vehicle, and presumably Nick drove to the apartment and back. Nick used his key card to enter the dormitory where he lived with Joshua at 2.42 a.m. This leaves over an hour unaccounted for. In addition, Nick had been romantically interested in Katie at one time, and he refused to take a so-called lie detector test. 
The internet search history on Joshua's computer had been erased after Joshua went missing. The police don't know who did this, but Nick would have been one of the people who had access to Joshua's computer. Looking at the factors against this theory, the time that was unaccounted for in Nick's story was not ideal for him being involved. Nick has an alibi until sometime around 1 or 1.30 a.m., plus it would have taken him 7 to 10 minutes to drive to the campus. It appears as though Joshua went missing before this. It doesn't make any sense that Joshua would have waited outside for over an hour with no coat to meet Nick. As far as the so-called lie detector test, no one can blame Nick for not taking this test. Polygraphs are pseudoscientific nonsense. Everyone should refuse to take a polygraph. As far as other friends being involved, I think this is unlikely as well. None of Nick's friends had a motive to harm him. I think it is reasonable to believe that the internet search history deletion had nothing to do with Joshua's disappearance. It is far more likely that somebody Joshua knew used his computer for something they wanted to hide. For example, the police later determined that some of the information which was erased and later recovered was about making fake identification cards. Theory number three is that monks on the college campus were involved in Joshua's disappearance. Joshua was rumored to be conducting research on scandals at the university involving monks who allegedly committed offenses against students. The police found no evidence on Joshua's computer to support this theory, unless, of course, the scandal was that the monks were trying to make fake identifications. Hoover the Bloodhound tracked Joshua's scent to St. John's Abbey, but the police implied that Hoover was not to be trusted under any circumstances. Theory number four is that Joshua was kidnapped and murdered after attempting to engage in a casual sexual encounter. Looking at the factors supporting this theory, a suspicious man was spotted on campus on two prior occasions. The man appeared to be engaged in casual encounters. There were also reports of attempted abductions in the area. Joshua left the party without saying anything, which was out of the ordinary. If he was going to meet a man, it makes sense that he would prefer not to advertise that information, especially considering he was Catholic and attending a Catholic college. Joshua left the party not long before midnight, as if he was trying to be somewhere at midnight. It's not hard to imagine a secret casual encounter being scheduled for midnight. It's a time when a person would still have enough energy for various clandestine activities, but potential witnesses in the area would be asleep. Looking at the factors against this theory, nobody witnessed a suspicious vehicle that night or observed Joshua in contact with anyone. Theory number five, perhaps Joshua decided to bring an end to his own life. He walked or otherwise made his way to some remote area and died from exposure or some other cause. There are a few problems with this theory. There is no indication that Joshua did not want to live. A large area was thoroughly searched, and walking into the wilderness and dying of exposure is an unusual way for someone to bring a conclusion to their life. Theory number six is that Joshua ran away to start a new life. He was tired of being a college student, tired of studying Alexander Hamilton, he just wanted something different in his life. He wanted to start fresh. This would explain why there was no sign of Joshua, but there are a few challenges with this theory. Joshua had no reason to run away. Living off the grid is difficult to accomplish. And why did he leave so many of his personal belongings behind? Those items might have come in handy during a life on the run. When considering these theories, how would I rank them from most to least probable? The two main competitors for the most probable theory would be theory number one, Joshua drowned in a lake, and theory number four, he was murdered by someone he met for a casual encounter. If the police are correct about Joshua's body not being in any lake, then of course the murder theory would be the most likely. But it's difficult for me to believe that they can be 100% certain. Even still, I'll take their word for it and go with theory number four, the homicide theory, as the most probable followed by theory number one, the drowning theory. After this, I would go with theory number five, Joshua deliberately walked into the cold night and died of exposure. Theory number three, he was murdered by vengeful monks after he uncovered their plan to take over the world with fake identifications. Theory number two, 
his friends spontaneously decided to murder him for no reason, and then theory number six, he ran away to start a new life. Now moving to my final thoughts. Joshua appeared to have desires which deviated from his religious beliefs. This put him in a tough position. He was trapped between two worlds. He decided to explore his desires through hidden casual encounters, probably believing that this was a safe endeavor. Whenever somebody arranges to be somewhere in secret, they put themselves at some risk. It creates an opportunity to commit murder with a lower probability of being caught. In a sense, the victim is doing part of the killer's work for them by putting themselves in a vulnerable position. The same element which makes a secret exciting makes it dangerous. Those are my thoughts on the case of Joshua Guimond. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a bloodhound with credibility problems. Thanks for watching.